You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Forming in Knoxville in the early 90s, Brandon Fisher and John Davis's chance meeting led to the formation of Super Drag. While the band's debut single, Sucked Out, peaked at number 17 on the Billboard Modern Rock charts, the band never reached the charts again during their decade of recording music. Despite this, their influence was felt by musicians, including myself and my friend Steve Sabosley in our own band, Punchline. Join us this week while we tell you why Super Drag has always been one hit thunder in our eyes. One hit is all you need to make the money guaranteed, and you can live off royalties forever. And it makes me wonder is it just a blunder, or is it one hit thunder? All right, so super drag. Yeah, baby. Good choice. Thank you. This is very easy considering we both like super drag already. So right. this wasn't a real challenge for us to be able to talk about super drag. Right. Uh, Matt asked me if I wanted to be a part of this podcast or do an episode and super drag was my gut instinct. Sometimes you got to go with the gut. Yep. And it was sucked out. Sucked out was the jam. Yeah. That got it all started. I liked it. It, it came out at a time where I, I was real into punk rock music and, but I, kind of like th- this is like oh yeah that's kind of good years later realized oh yeah i really like that probably better than most of the stuff that i was actually listening to at mm-hmm. that time because i liked punk rock music exclusively but then they became a band that we all really liked right i guess the song grabs you because of that chorus uh, or yeah that would be considered the chorus of the song it's but... good the, the verse is kind of chorusy also right, right. it's the same same chords is is basket case, not that that, not that that necessarily matters, but it's just it's kind of a rare chord progression that you when you when there are hits that have that I always kind of take take note note of it. But what it, it's that chorus, it's that almost the song almost stops. And it's almost, I feel like it's that, that he hits that. An anti chorus. Yeah, I guess that's what you would call it. But he almost, to a point of an almost scream mm-hmm. of that. And uh, I think that is what makes, I think that's the memorable, the most memorable thing about the song, the song that would take it from, you know, a lot of songs in that style of music right. that super drag is and and take that to the next level and give them a one give them a one hit it's with, cool how much it showcases the bass you know that chorus it's just bass and vocal isn't it meryl meryl oh meryl, is it only bass meryl, 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 meryl. yeah wow i didn't even think uh, i guess i wasn't paying attention to that that's something i should be paying attention to but uh yeah and then so i guess this was another st- it's another deal where, okay, Super Drag is actually awesome. So it worked out. It worked out, but like, it seems like, so their first EP was an eight track, an eight track recorded EP that came out in 1995. And then they were signed to Electra Records and this was out in 1996. And was it like that quick? So actually they recorded the album with Sucked Out on it and then went home and immediately recorded that eight track. Al- mm-hmm. album and release that first so technically they just got signed made the record and then sucked out was on that record but they recorded the record and they turned it into the to the label and the label said you got to record more and then sucked out was written and oh. written and recorded added to the album wow yeah uh you know as a person that that i you know, as we've played music forever at these store to like, now it's been a couple of them where it's like, geez, you didn't even like you guys. I mean, as far as I know, you weren't a band or you, you weren't like 
touring for years and paying your dues, you just like mm-hmm. made this thing and it instantaneously got big. Like yeah. it, it, like in the matter of a year, how does that Interest- happen? Interesting time, I guess. I don't know. It was yeah. before the downfall of CDs and right. I, yeah, I don't know how. I, I guess it was, a, it was a band's market. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it seems like <laughs> Electra Records. sounds impossible. It seems like in, in other episodes we've done that Electra Records <laughs> is a lot of times like this catalyst of these artists that it seems like came out of nowhere. Right. And then, but I mean, in the case of Super Drag, they're a great band and they went on to release lots and lots of great music. But I don't, I mean, obviously, since this is a one hit wonder podcast, they never had anything as big as sucked out. Like that was right. That was the biggest song. And, you know, but at least they used that as a springboard to be like, okay, we can be a band and put out lots of good albums. And, right. uh, you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, oh, but I guess it does say here that they did form in 1992. So I guess they were a band for a while. They just didn't release an album mm-hmm. for years. So maybe that is a little bit different of a story than some of these other ones that we've had, such as um, Space Hog, for example, <laughs> right. who just started and just were instantaneously big. Right. I, uh, but anyway. A couple fascinating things about Super Drag. They recorded, I believe every album had this producer, Tim Raskalinitz was involved. No, Nick Raskalinitz was involved. But he wasn't always. He was like their friend who was a producer. And every time they made a record, he would come. But he wouldn't necessarily be like the producer. So even when the label partnered them up with Jerry Finn to do um, to do a record, this Nick Raskalinitz guy still like went and was was a part of it. And I think that's pretty unique. I've never heard of heard of anything like that. I thought that was thought that was pretty cool. The story that I heard about that I believe Matt told me about was that, so they had this album with a song that was a success. And then, so they had the budget for their next album and they wanted an album full of radio friendly hits. So instead they just went and did the complete opposite of that. Right. And uh, with the exception of one song, well, the head trip in every key was the album, but there was one uh, do the vampire mm-hmm. um that was like the the minor single from it right but for the most part it, it is pretty like kind of out there it's right. not which i think that's cool I, I you know i like to think that that's what i would do in that want to do in that position but i don't know it, right. would, it would take a lot of a lot of guts to just do what you wanted when you might know that you're leaving notoriety and success and money and stuff on the table if you had just done uh, you're supposed to or whatever. Right. But um, I feel like that's why so many people, so many bands and artists flop though, is when they try to create right. the magic of a fall, fo- like create a, a follow up hit right. and they just try to, you know, follow the same pattern. And it's just people yeah. see through it. If it's not right, it's not real. Uh, I'm saying I, I wouldn't want to do that, right. but it would be hard if you were, in a situation where you have all these people working your music, like mm-hmm. we're in a situation, we work our own music. And right. We, so we can do whatever we want, but if you had a team of people that were advise, you know, I assume we're advising you if you're big enough that you have a video on regular rotation MTV, that mm-hmm. you would probably have a lot of people involved who are trying to get you to do what they want you to do. So that's pretty cool. Pretty right. cool, Super Drag. Nice right. job. Yeah, that. it seemed like they did not enjoy the music business beyond their hit. You know, they uh-huh. they recorded what at, what that head trip in every key. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it sounds like it just got shelved. Didn't get much of a didn't get much of a push. 
Yeah, I you know, honestly, I have no idea as to Super Drag's popularity. Mm. I know that everyone I know knows who Super Drag is, but we also know who a lot of bands are that aren't popular. So uh, I don't know if, if Super Drag would play in Pittsburgh, if it would be a packed house or right. if it would be at Club Cafe. I don't know. I right. have no idea. Let's take a guess at their monthly listeners. I just pulled it up, but I didn't look at it yet. Well, they have sucked out. So, like, you know that's going to... right going to sway that but that you're going by spotify monthly listeners yeah uh, we can go by that or if you want we can establish an over under and choose over or under oh um i'm gonna guess uh <laughs> um two hundred thousand. that's about what i was gonna say i'll, I'll say 150 150 okay it means thirty seven thousand eight hundred and forty nine monthly listeners the same as punchline yeah that's like the same <laughs> that's the same as us yeah that's crazy whoa and sucked out sucked out has 2.3 million listens is this song not a hit it was a hit whoa 2.3 million that's not really that many right for a hit song right i mean you know i guess it could have just been put on spotify recently but that seems unlikely I mean, we're, you know, we play in an independent band who's been at it for a long time or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I assume that if you had a song that was a hit. Like a 90s Yeah, a 90s hit that you would, you're, I don't know. We go back and forth on if those kind of Spotify statistics and things like that are the, like, end-all, be-all of knowing a band's popularity or whatever. So I don't know if that is a bad thing for super drag or a good thing for punchline right. are, are we are we just more popular than we knew or is super drag not as popular as you know either way like i'm, I'm just surprised i would have thought that, right. that that you know that's sucked out alone still i mean i feel like i still hear sucked out here and there but then again matt uh matt our producer he did not know sucked out, which it was kind of surprising to me for a person that was so right. likes '90s music and and everything. I, I was surprised he didn't know that song. But you know, I love "Last Call for for Vitri- mm-hmm. Vitriol." Is that even how you say yep. that word? Mm-hmm. That album's awesome. We like, you know, we both like feeling like I do. Oh, that's the best song. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're they're a really really good band, mm-hmm. and I'm just kind of shocked that maybe <laughs> maybe they're not a one hit one. But yeah, that's a hit. It's right. a hit. Uh, let me see if I have any stats on how big of a hit that was. Uh, I mean, yeah, it was it was in played frequently on MTV and radio. I mean, for sure. I mean, that's how I mm-hmm. knew them even before the after the fact. I mean, it was a decade later, at least maybe longer before I. Yeah, it was probably a decade later where I was like, "Oh, Super Drag, this is really cool." Like I did like sucked right. out, but like listen to some of their other music i don't know like what made me listen right but oh yeah i I, I don't know either because you i sent you feeling like i did right right thank you (laughs) no problem that's a big one yeah but (laughs) i don't know what made me listen right like they their other their second single after sucked out was that destination or or some major song which that's a cool song yeah it's very um dissonant or something there's something about same kind of things with the guitars as feeling like i do where i don't know if it's whammy right or if it's what it is about it it's just like really like whatever effect it is you as a guitarist you might know a little bit more it's like dissonant eerie sounding mm-hmm. almost it's a lot of like bending probably right yeah that, that's I, I, I saw well i didn't see super drag but i saw john davis's new band that someone else from super drag is in i think tim or tom Papas is his, the other guy from super drag's name they played at that place the basement that was by my house in nashville and i heard one day like hey John Davis's new band is playing at the basement, and I thought, "Why well, live a block away from there? I gotta go." And so I went and saw them saw them play, and they had three guitar players, and it was so loud, and they all they all had the whammy bar Bigsby, and were just you know de- delay pedals and uh-huh. take you know strumming a chord and then slamming that bar so it like dives dives down right. just really just in and in but it's so cool i love that They're sound so, that's i think like, that's like a a shoe a shoegazy thing yeah for sure yeah. they're that's like their signature thing right so they did a second album yeah you said like you said jerry finn and they so when after regretfully yours 
the label asked them who they wanted to work with and their the one thing that they wanted is they wanted to record to tape. That's when everybody was starting to switch to Pro Tools and they were very against Pro Tools. And Jerry Finn was the first guy that they talked to who just didn't bat an eye at it and said, you know, okay, like we, we, we can do that. And Jerry Finn's big claim to fame was he mixed Dookie. Yeah. Well, yeah, then they, they, then, so they released that, which I guess obviously did not, not, did, there was no more hits right. from that. And then, so then it says they self-released four more albums, and then they disbanded in 2003. A lot of good music on. I didn't even know that those albums were self-released, at least the, the ones that I'm familiar with. Uh, you know, there was the Last Call for Vitriol, which I like. There was In the Valley of the Dying Stars, is that right. one of them? Mm-hmm. I feel like in the era of just listening to things on streaming services, don't get the album experience mm-hmm. as much. So I don't know what's on what, really, but yeah. They're, I think Super Drag is one of those bands where Super Drag always sounds like Super Drag. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like Sucked Out could have maybe been on a later album and it, you wouldn't have noticed. Yeah, they, I, okay, and the, the thing that we like to talk about a little bit too is like, okay, if that if Sucked Out was 1996, mm-hmm. what was going on in the world of music in 1996 that that was a part of? And I feel like that was at the early part of that late 90s um rock that wasn't they they i feel like they still have just like that bendy guitars they have those little elements of grunge Mm -hmm. i guess you would say so they they're kind of on the borderline but then you have the bands like we were talking about vertical horizon and tonic and whatever all these like we did an episode about Space Hog that that these bands that were no longer really like grunge. It was more like um, uh, accessible, uh, really clean, re- yeah, really yeah, yeah. slick production. Um, yeah, because you know, around that time, the other things that were popular uh, these these are the the top one hundred songs of that year. But it was like. You know, top song was Macarena. Uh, But otherwise, rock stuff, Alanis Morissette, Ironic was out. Gin Blossoms, Follow You Down, that was that year. Uh, You know, it was Tupac, LL Cool J. Goo Goo Dolls name. Like Dishwalla Mm -hmm. was around at that point. And um, yeah, as as far as rock stuff, yeah, it was kind of getting away from grunge music at that point. And uh, no doubt, no doubt just a girl. Mm-hmm. was that time so uh wow that's crazy <laughs> when i think about just a girl i think we were in high school and i would come home from school and i would eat so many oreos and watch mtv videos nice. and braveheart on repeat and i just remember watch always it was like around the time that just a girl was big Man, I eat so many Oreos. Like, would eat so many Oreos in one sitting. They were double stuff. I, I mean, I still can't shake it. It was just, a, it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, super drag fun fact that I think you'll like. Uh, they were very big. All Descendants fans. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, I, yeah. Do that. It's interesting to hear when bands come from punk rock. Like mm-hmm. you don't know where some of these bands came from or what their influences was, but that's cool. Right. Nice. Um, John Davis has, the singer has a band camp page where he posts every, he'll sit down, make, he, he demos exclusively on an eight track or maybe it's four track, but eight track or four track. And he will put everything he makes immediately on the internet. So mm-hmm. he doesn't like to wait to first, you know, to record it for real and just put stuff out directly and does it all on a four track. Well, it sounds to me like, you know, we have, um, I, I got to put everything in the lens of like us, right. what we've experienced is we've been this, this band making the music that we like, we're an independent band, but also chasing that, um, success but basically for success meaning uh, like hitting as many people 
with our music as we can and anybody that would like us at least hearing us mm -hmm. to, and, and like being able to like make a living off of writing songs. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, the goal, I'm not saying that like, we're trying to be uh, whatever, just, just that's the goal. But it sounds like this dude, this band had that right off the bat. Right. And we're like, all right, that was all right, but I want to do my thing. And it seems like, pretty the, him and them were pretty cool with that right which is which is pretty cool like i i don't know i don't know what i that that's like an interesting thing to think about i'd be, probably be an interesting person to talk to right <laughs> and and just know i think that's pretty respectable that you follow your what you want to make and not be i don't know we were, I don't want to, you know, trash anybody, but to not be, I don't know, Sugar Ray or like whatever, like to not just like be like, oh, we had a hit with like this radio song. Let's make that song again and again and right. again. So that's, that's pretty cool. Right. And that's probably why us as people that make songs really like Super Drag. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's pretty awesome. I just love that song. I love, I love it when bands have breakout songs that are short and snappy and I always think how I would be – it's got to be interesting for a band who primarily rocks to, like, get a hit, and the hit is, like, a like a slow, so a slow song, and then people identify that band as, like, a slow band or I mean, something. No. And Super Drag sucked out just that uh, – I, I just want, like – I want every punchline song that we, like, make a music video for to be two and a half minutes long and fast and, and upbeat. Right. And 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 fun. I just love that. Love a little bop. Yeah, it'd be a nightmare. It, <laughs> no one'd be a nightmare to have a big song, but it'd be a nightmare to have to play a slow ass song that like is just a downer right. uh, as your song that everybody wants to hear. Right, uh, for sure. Before coming on to this podcast, thank you for having me. I did a little research on other podcasts about Super Drag listen to an interview with John Davis on this podcast called The Pirate Satellite with Ethan Luck. Ethan Luck was in the Supertones. He lives in Nashville, and he's very good friends with our buddy Jack O'Shea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had John Davis on his podcast. And Ethan asked John what his favorite Super Drag song was, and he said, he said, I'm going to go with Sucked Out. He said that that, wow. you know, it was because it achieved what it did. He's like, um, you know, it might not be a song that I would sit down and write right now, but like, I'm, he's just very proud of it. You know, I'm sure a lot nice. of these, a lot of the people who wrote the songs that you guys are talking about on your podcast might not, might not say that and might like resent the hit. You know how you'll hear yeah. about bands, you know, not want to play, play their, their song anymore. And he he um, owns he owns, he owns it. it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I like to cool. think I like to think that if if we got a hit, that I would totally own it. Right, I do. But but I say that being a guy who like some of the songs that people like our band like the most, I am kind of like, uh. But that's because they're not hits. Just, right, <laughs> they're just because they're popular punchline songs. They're not necessarily a hit. Right. They're just and 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 not liking them is only because we've played it for mm -hmm. so long that like and so many times that that you just kind of get sick of it right. more than anything. Or or it could be as something as simple as, oh, I don't like the I don't like the song as a like a song. It was, I wouldn't dislike a song because it was popular or because, you know, like like Universe is a popular song for Punchline. I still like that one. Right. I still like playing it because I like it musically and it's still but like people like the song Color Ten by Punchline. I'm like, ah, don't really like the song musically so right. that's why i'm not psyched about it he said that sucked out was one of those songs that he just sat down and poured right out road in like 20 25 minutes yeah yeah that's cool yeah um that's as i i believe that that that's probably how most great songs because if you if you're thinking about it if you're overthinking it for too long it's probably you're probably doing not what comes natural right but Life is a Highway by Tom Cochran sure seems like it was written in 
two minutes <laughs> if you read the lyrics <laughs> i love bringing up the tom cochran life is a highway in every episode because it's a pretty bad song yeah but it's also like pretty good yeah i think my dad had that on a cassette single yeah in his car yeah I'm surprised mike didn't bring that up that was his episode yeah uh, unless it was your dad i mean no my dad your, wasn't a your, big... your mom had a uh who was that? Who sings Rockabye? Yeah, I remember your mom. Mullins. Mullins. Need more Mullins. Nice. Yeah. yeah, that's another Michael Scott. Didn't your mom have that cassette single? Uh, no, she had the whole album. Oh, nice. On cassette. Uh, Rockabye. Um, it's like Nashville with a tan. Um, uh, my mom had, yeah, you, you said the same thing as me, as two dudes that play in a band together for the past 22 years. Right. Our parents do not listen to music. And no. that is... So weird. It, yeah, it is. Like, it I is mean, weird. they they listen to whatever's on. Right. I think, you know, they'll put on the radio and like whatever's playing, they'll listen to it. But there was no collection of albums at right. my house. There was my mom had some tapes in her car. There was, well, she did have. I'll give her credit. She did have Jim Blossoms. Mm-hmm. She had the Jim Blossoms. Uh, she had Counting Crows. You know, other than that, it was like. Stevie Nicks. There was some Stevie Nicks tapes in right. there. And and but in general, yeah, my parents weren't big into music. I think PJ's dad had a crash test dummies yeah. tape. Yeah. I that, so. If I ever get to come back on this this show, I want to do that. Do that yeah. song. Yeah, that's a good one too. What year was that? Ninety four. Oh yeah. What a weird time where you could mm-hmm. that song couldn't be popular now, could it? I don't think so. Well, I I, I don't know. What is Every- po- what is popular now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, I know what is. Po- I think a lot of what I listen to is pretty popular. But I like Matt told me that Lizzo, that Truth Hurts song, that it was like the number one song for a long time. I didn't even know. I knew obviously. I know she's popular and huge, but I didn't know that it was like sensation. Well, that I didn't know. I knew it was a sensation even, but I didn't know like it was a chart topping on the radio Mm -hmm. song i thought it was just like i don't know popular among people that like like, but i guess i i I don't have a concept of like what's popular on the charts right (laughs) or what what the most popular song but i guess you can tell just by paying attention to like what everybody's talking about that probably means it's a Mm -hmm. popular song right hey what are your what are your favorite super drag songs for anyone who's not not familiar what's a good place good couple songs to start with um i'd say feeling like i do uh that's my number one favorite super drag song and i would say um this one's like way more upbeat and not at all what we're talking about like the shoegazy type of thing but like that baby goes to Mm -hmm. 11 same album first song from it uh that song's great that destination ursa major song is pretty awesome right um that's that's like a good example of what super drag sounds like. I think that's like their thing. Right. Um, Oh, what other songs do I really like by super drag? Sold you an alibi. Uh, you know that one. What album is that on? I don't even know that one. Sold you an alibi is on the second record. So head trip. Okay. Uh, that's one of my faves. And then she is a Holy grail also on that album. Kind of a slower waltzier song. Nice. Um, yeah, I, we we do this thing on the episodes where it's either is the song a one hit blunder mm-hmm. or is it one hit thunder? Oh, uh, I think it's pretty clear for this. Yeah, one. this one. This one's easy. Yeah, we had a split decision on Tom Cochran. I said it was a one hit blunder. Right. Mike thought it was a one hit thunder right uh so you know we don't always don't always agree on uh what is what but mike uh, has interesting taste in in music yeah for those of you who are listening you might not know uh but if you have if if the other episode has aired yet uh that that uh i've had we've had two brothers on here as guests uh steve and mike sabosley who's a guest on a different episode they're brothers and um but they 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 look similar to each other, but they have very they're very different people. And uh, Mike has some 
I give Mike credit. He likes a lot of stuff, and it's awesome. He's a big music fan. It's awesome, but sometimes some of the things he likes is pretty funny. What do you think like, his dream tour would be? <laughs> um, I think Mike's dream tour would be Bad Religion. Um, uh, oh, man, I don't know. Uh, maybe Counting Crows. I could see then also like Lil Wayne. Yeah. And Alan Jackson. <laughs> and just throw Tom Cochran on there for him, too, I guess. Uh, the number you have reached is 100.7 WMMS. It wasn't just a radio station, it was a lifestyle. Cleveland is, is a rock and roll city for sure. I do like the Chicago's. Yeah! Down! The Wrath of the Buzzer. WMMS. Cleveland. The rise and fall of one of the most iconic radio stations in America. Profiles, The Wrath of the Buzzard, P-R-O-H Files. Subscribe now wherever you get podcasts. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty, host of the Punk Rock NBA podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. My podcast is all about doing what you love for a living, and every week I sit down and talk to people who have done exactly that. For example, musicians like Tommy from Between the Buried Me, Matt from Periphery, Lil Lotus and Shinigami, among many others, photographers, artists, designers, YouTubers like Glenn Fricker and Sarah Dietschy, and I unpack exactly how they got to where they are today with the goal of helping Helping you do the same. So if that sounds cool, you can listen and subscribe at soundtalentmedia.com and I'll see you there. But uh yeah, man. I, hey, I, if anybody wants to check out uh John Davis's bandcamp page, it's all one word, high bias cassette dash based operation tm dot bandcamp. Easy enough. <laughs> easy enough. High bias cassette dash based operation tm dot bandcamp dot dot com you can wow. dm me and i'll send you a link to it if you want wow um i like to think about a little bit when we're talking about the songs this song came out in 1996 what were you do i mean i guess you said well that was for just a girl but were you sitting around eating oreos when sucked out was on or I what was, else was going on well that was the year we started or no that wasn't the year we started punchline that was the year before um, I was playing guitar and I was writing probably sad, sad, depressing songs that weren't very good. Mm-hmm. And what else, what other music would I have liked at that? Time? I was I was doing just the opposite. I was wearing a fedora and listening to ska music and nice uh, ninety six. Yeah. yeah, see that's cool because back to, I wanted to say this when we were talking about our parents. We found music ourselves, mm-hmm. and that's kind of neat. Removing that from the equation. Like everyone who, like I know so many people who love Neil Young and nothing against Neil Young, but those people 100% like Neil Young, I assume, because their parents played it when they were, when they were younger. And so that's why you and I are not huge. Well, I'm also big Neil fans. I would also like to say that I guess I really, I had to have thought about this before, but like I'm also an only child. I'm an only child whose parents weren't into music. So my, love of music comes 100% from TV. Mm -hmm. I pretty, uh, I remember really liking um, Faith No More Epic. When Faith No More Epic came out, that was like the first rock song that I could remember liking. And I I loved it. And and maybe I should give Epic a little bit because before that it was Belle Bev DeVoe. Yeah. But Bell Boots Vaux was actually even after that. Oh, right. I did love, as a kid, I loved our, like, yeah, Bell Biv DeVoe and, and uh, uh, New Edition. Well, you know, they came from New Edition. Mm-hmm. But, like, that's what I liked, uh, Boys to Men. I loved all the East Coast family, man. Uh, it just, uh, that's what I, uh, and I still, now coming back around all these years later, like, I'm like, oh, I do, I like r&b music and i like and i I feel like i really like bass and i really like kick drum Mm -hmm. and when i listen to music like you listen when i'm especially when i'm by myself in my car all the way up and it is bass heavy Mm -hmm. and it and if a song doesn't and i mean yeah sure maybe 
being a bass player could be part of it. But I think it's that rhythm is such a huge part of it for me. And, and I think that's why personally, if acoustic music and music that like folk music, it's why, unless, unless the melodies are just like out of this world, there's a lot of like run of the mill, like folky stuff that people just like lose their minds over. I'm like, I don't, get it right i don't get it i don't get you guys and i guess they're an amazing like live band or whatever maybe if i saw them but like we were talking about the the avet brothers like right. but i i don't they rock yeah well maybe i just haven't seen them live or whatever mm-hmm. but like i do like that one song but like just straight up acoustic music but i but i like but i love boney Vare because he incorporates like elements of hip hop and like, you know, and like Bjorky type stuff and like weird electronic elements into his music. So that could, that is what could make me like a folky artist. Mm-hmm. But if someone's just up there with an acoustic guitar, I'm like, I need the, I need the low end. Right. I need the, the beat. I need the, the groove. I do. I need a groove. I need a groove too. You know, I, I can't, a sentimental sappy song on an acoustic guitar. It's just not going to be something right that I'm feeling. Right. And I'm sure there are exceptions to that. Fall asleep but... before you hear whatever that story's story is. That yeah. Telling, you know? Right. Right. But, but yeah, <laughs> I, I guess I, I, I personally had to, I didn't have a sibling or a parent or a whatever to get me into music. Maybe that's why I like music so much. I had to discover it on my own. Right. I don't know. And who got you on the punk? Blasco? Yeah, my friend Josh, but it was it was in conjunction with punk hitting like or or like, you know, the bands that we like it was kind of in conjunction with that hitting M T V and stuff, Green Day. Mm-hmm. When Duke Dookie came out, like, you know, I was pretty in, in uh impressionable thirteen year old or whatever and like so you had that and then you had a friend who also was like, Hey, if you like that, check out the entire fat records discography mm-hmm. and operation Ivy and all these, ep- like they really opened a door right into a entire world. Yeah. It almost felt like finding out about Kerplunk, like Kerplunk was a secret. Yeah. <laughs> it all, that stuff all hap- happened really fast. Cause you know, if 1993 slash four green day came around and all of a sudden in, in the punk, it was only 1991 that I was getting a, Oh, I was psyched. Got my first ever compact disc. It was vanilla ice. Mm-hmm. And like, so in that amount of time, something, you know, a lot of music happened. Like red Hot chili peppers. Were pro- there was like these crossover bands, like right. started getting, not that the red Hot chili peppers are punk, but like definitely elements of punk mm-hmm. rock in there. And, and uh, you, these bands that were popular and pretty mainstream, but also like rocked, you know, and of course we, we were at the most impressionable age possible when Nirvana hit, right? And and, and a whole wave of music, and uh, and and not just Nirvana, but I talked the other day about what an influence Beavis and Butthead mm-hmm. had. Not only was Beavis and Butthead like funny, but they played so much music, mm-hmm. exposed me to so much music. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known about Ween. Right. Ween became like one of my favorite bands, and so. I don't know. Influential to me. And was what, that Ween's big break? I really think it was. Cause I mean, that was, I think they, I think they copped to that. Is I think, Ween a one hit wonder? I don't even think that's considered a hit. Yeah. <laughs> that that's a, so no, mm-hmm. like they, they've never really had a, a, a hit. Mm-hmm. That's a hit to us, but I'd say no. I mean, they were just a, a, you know, they were on 120 minutes mm-hmm. and, and Beavis and Butthead. But uh, yeah, but it's a it's pretty cool that I'm I'm glad that think about how much cooler it is that we were at, at such an impressionable impressionable age at that time of that wave of bands and like basically what is called like alternative music right that was so out there. Think about like watching 120 minutes and seeing like Chibo Motto and mm-hmm. then seeing like I saw all for the first time on 120 minutes or like you know think about how much cooler that is than if we would have been that same age at like 1998 or 99, we might right have been into, we might've been hit with like vertical horizon right. and yeah. been like, Oh man, vertical. Or horizon. if we were a few years younger and been rolling the 
hair metal. I'm so glad. That, oh, I'm so glad. So I glad missed. I missed, missed that. Never got into that for a second. Yeah, man. I mean, we just did we just dodge a bullet. The music's bad. Yeah, it's very rare that I like a like. I can't. I mean, Guns and Roses had a couple. But right. I don't consider I like them. them. I like. Yeah. I don't consider they were a different thing. But like, yeah, the Poison and Motley Crue, and I mean, it's just. Could you imagine like? Oh, it's a bunch of assholes in spandex <laughs> and makeup singing about like boobs or whatever. Like, could you imagine if that's what we were into? Right. Like, I don't even think it's. I'm. I. I, I wasn't into it at the time. I remember it. Right. And I, I like to think we were conscious enough to pass on it because it was around when we were when, when we, were we were kids, pretty young. Yeah. yeah. There was like there were like exceptions. There was like a song like Great White. Uh, What's their song? Great White. Once bitten, twice shy. I remember liking that chorus or right. whatever. But like for the most part, I steered to like Boys to Men. Right. And like, and I'm glad I did because I still like Boys to Men. But yeah, it's kind of like uh, I'm I'm glad I missed that. I don't get it. I, I I don't get why people would think that. Or or I don't get like how people could still think it's good. Right. Like I could be like look back at that and be like, oh man, like what? Why did I like that? But it's like some people still think that music is really good it's, mm-hmm. i really think it's not i think Neat. it's like really uh um devoid of heart right <laughs> and it's just like manufactured garbage like for, unskinny bop is not a bop no no i i mean it's just a lot of a lot of bad music that i'm glad i didn't get into i mean but it's everything's everything's opinion just because i'm talking shit on hair metal someone could talk shit right back to me about Mm -hmm. most of the stuff or my band (laughs) or or like you know most of the stuff i listen to i don't like country music except for the exceptions of like i guess people that are like but i don't like pop country music right i think that's a very bad style of music but i agree can't get into it no no steering it back to stupor drag for a second here it doesn't matter to me and it wouldn't really change my opinion of it but do like a were they like a Christian band? I think that he's John Davis was born again oh. at some point, I believe they they oh. say. Um and he's made several records as John Davis and I believe that they are have Christian overtones. Definitely whatever I checked out years ago when I heard that he had a new record out was very in your face Christian Whoa lyrics. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably <laughs> that would probably turn me off right. to it. Uh, just it's not something. I mean, when I listen to music, I want to be able to relate to it, and I right. probably can't relate to that. I got nothing against whatever religion someone wants to be, or or about expressing whatever you want to express in your right. music. Like that's great if that's uh, what you want to do. Right. Um, but you know, I have some friends. It's just a different thing. It's it's strange. It's like it is. if somebody said, you know, I'm only going to write songs about the forest. And then you have this one band that you like, but you're like, oh, every song they sing is about the forest. Right. Like, I, don't <laughs> I, I, I have some. I wish it was more abstract, more like. <laughs> yeah. I have some friends. Hey, maybe we could have them as a guest at some point and they could say it themselves or whatever. But a couple friends in bands that were very um, associated with the world of Christian music mm-hmm. by being on like tooth and nail records and mm-hmm. stuff like that and like but they aren't at all uh like christian or anything and they were like eh, it's it's a weird it was a strange line to walk of like uh you know not being religious but then you're associated right. with that so closely you know i feel like it's it, it, it's none of my business but it's a little bit of my business if I'm a fan and mm-hmm. uh, and then it, it happens out of nowhere. But I just remember, uh, I think it was uh, Zach from uh, 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 Sullivan yeah. told me all, like he was like, a, so, because maybe they were, maybe, no, it says they formed in Knoxville, but I felt like Superdrag had something to do with like where they were from. Maybe he was just a big fan. Maybe he was just a big fan of that, of John, right. mm-hmm. whatever. And he, he told me all about that. Cause Sullivan was like Christian ish, right. I think, or they were in that world. Right. But anyway, 
it's not really any of my business. And I, I ain't dragging anybody here. It's just not, mm-hmm. not my thing mm-hmm. that, that, uh, you know, that I really want to hear songs about. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I get the impression that his music sounds very much like super, drag. super drag. Yeah. Yeah. And the Lees of Memory was his other band, and that's I don't believe that's a a Christian music thing. And yeah. so if anybody out there is a super drag fan, check out the Lees of Memory or that Bandcamp site. If you just search John Davis Bandcamp eight track. John Davis like the singer of corn. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's a was is it J O N? Is this It's J O H N. Oh, this one is. Yeah. Okay. No, no relation to Jonathan Davis of Corn. I don't think so. Jim Davis of Garfield. Corn's <laughs> drummer's from Bell Vernon, where, where we're from. Bell Vernon? I thought it was West Newton. West Newton, same thing. <laughs> no, West Newton is not <laughs> Bell Vernon. Uh, yeah, that is wild that no. It's it's crazy. It's the, a suburb of Bell Vernon. Yeah, okay. Well, the, <laughs> so our little tiny, like, hometown where, you know, where we're originally from. The drummer of corn is from right there, but yet I never hear anybody. I mean, we talk about it a little bit, right? But like for being in such a big band, you think you would hear about that a little bit more. That bums me out. Right. If our band ever got super huge, are people not gonna right. even bring it up in Bell Vernon? Yeah, like, come I on, I don't know. That's that's a little bit of a bummer, right? I would. I think that they should have like a a, a like statue of him in West New York, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. Apparently, he's a badass drummer. I know. Uh, you know, corn not not really my thing, but uh, did you like corn at some point? I actually did like. And yeah, I should have talked about this when Shrimp Man, aka Jerse, was our guest. But the first corn album, I don't know that I don't know like what year that was, but for some reason, like I bought it and liked it. I mean, there's some stuff that I liked. And maybe I can listen to it and still like that. They had that song Blind. Mm-hmm. I remember the album started with like so much ride cymbal. It was like. <laughs> you know, you know that song I'm talking about? I don't. I can see, I can see I'm going blind. Uh, um, but maybe it was just like the heaviness right. of it. Because, I mean, they, I think they were pretty responsible for, I think they were responsible for Limp Bizkit. Mm-hmm. I think they like. We like Limp Bizkit. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. I mean. Are you Yeah, sure. Limp Biscuit could be like something you go, you look back on and be like, "Oh man, I like." But like, honestly, the that first album, right. those songs like slammed, right? And like, they you couldn't deny that it like, especially when you're like a teenager and mm-hmm. that comes out, and you couldn't deny that it made you want to break stuff. That right. Ma- it like was a release. And right. And, what uh, year was that, would that have been? 98 i saw them at a at a warp i i I mean i was going to like either the first or second warp tour i ever went to and i remember that somebody i believe it was uh uh justin lost (laughs) had um got the limp biscuit out and we listened to it on the way down like damn they did that cover of faith right and you know i'm not like ashamed that i like that it was it it was cool right like yeah they they got a lot less cool as the years went by right. and rap rap metal really became a lame thing yeah. but like uh at least they were at the forefront of it and then also from that world came the deftones mm-hmm. deftones are badass but they are they walk a fine line of like they're almost new metal in some ways right. but they're not but the, but what are but but if not what what are they they they're like very heavy ambient type music uh but they're just unique and creative enough to not call them new metal mm-hmm. or something like uh but i love deftones they have a super drag connection it's that nick rascalinitz guy he's produced some deftones oh stuff. nice yeah and foo fighters i don't know which 
wow. albums. Anybody can look it up, though. Yeah, yeah. pretty cool. Uh, there, as far as like other stuff, like is there any other stuff from around this area, around around when Super Drag came out? Bring it back around. Uh, that like you were listening to at the time, and you're lo- like, oh man, I, I I was definitely listening to way too much ska. Like right. I love ska. I'm yeah. glad I listen you, to ska. You endorse the entire entire genre. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm talking bands from other countries. Yeah, I'm talking the most obscure ska bands you yep. could find. Right. You know, like I liked it all. Right. You know, and then it just I wasn't more into the punk ska. Yeah, I mean I was too. I wasn't into like the earlier waves. I mean I, I was totally I was fully invested in the third wave of ska. It needed to be at least a little bit punk. Right. If it if it was too like the I didn't like the toasters. Yeah. I didn't like you know, bands you had to have like distorted guitars at least, mm-hmm. you know. I also celebrated the entire like Lookout Records catalog, which was rough. Right, there was a lot of rough music on there. Like, did you hear the Queers Christmas song on that Christmas? I think I compilation to that it. we're on. I think I listened to. I it. I thought that was one of the better one of the better songs. Yeah, we I could got, talk about that. Yeah, some other time. I gotta listen to that again. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, the Queers and Screeching Weasel. Yeah, I, I understand why I like. But that, I was like going deep into the catalog of like. Such like badly recorded, like I just I think I just liked that logo. Right. <laughs> like anything that had that logo or a fat logo on it, I was I was into it. Right. Yeah, I was when I think about like Radiohead the Bends, mm-hmm. I love that album. I think that came out in ninety five. And I look back on that album and I'm like, Yeah, yeah, little Steve, good taste. Yeah, and then I'm just... like, Yeah, but you also loved live. Yeah. <laughs> True. Like, <laughs> True. You better you better watch it. We got some live connections. <laughs> nice. I mean, I I still like some some live. I don't know. Int- interesting. Interesting band. Yeah. Very very strange. Band. I just I, can't I was... shake. I've heard you say to well over a hundred people in twenty years that you can't believe that they have a song that's a hit song that says placenta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, that, they're the, uh, they're the only band that ever has and ever will say the word placenta in a hit. Is song. that a Grammy category? Did they win that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I never liked them. I always thought it was like a weird shirtless guy with a ponytail. Right. I didn't really dig his voice or right. their style, but I mean, I'm not saying they're not good. Right. Just not. They had a little butt rock in them. Yeah. For sure, um, but uh, yeah, that that I mean, I feel like at that time, probably I had some collective soul. Did you have a collective soul? You of course had that album, right? Yeah. Oh. Right. <laughs> yeah. My sister, not a big music fan. That was a band that she liked. She yeah. liked the Collective Soul. Right. So, Our buddy John Oliva, he's toured with him for the last couple of years. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um. Yeah, but for the most part, anything I liked. There's not too many uh, now. I, uh, being where I am in in my life, it's it's. There's not too many things that I listen to that I'm like super embarrassed that I liked. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Limp Biscuit would like be the closest thing to that. But even that, I'm like, oh, I get why I like that. Right. You know, I might not listen to it now, or I might listen to it now and be like, oh yeah, this is still catchy. Right. Uh, it also feels like that was more of a time like when bands like Limp Biscuit and insane clown posse came out that they were saying things that you just didn't hear Mm -hmm. in other songs like that's gone now there's so many songs out there i feel like people are less uptight about lyrics and now there's lots of clowns rapping right (laughs) (laughs) there's literally are other aren't there literally other like protégés of i see either rapping clowns twisted yeah yeah i mean but uh you know i'm not Twisted.bandcamp.com. I'm, I'm a juggalo, and I will always be a juggalo. Right. Uh, and I the the juggalo hate that people like that. It's just it's stupid. Mm-hmm. It's real, really, really stupid. I will say some of those early ICP albums have some very questionable lyrics about things like, oh, like I don't know. It, 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 it like like school shootings, and like. I mean that Young. song. That song, "Toy Box," is about a kid who doesn't have friends in school, and he has yeah. he finds his parents and like violent toy box, and then shoots up the school. Yeah, and stuff about like young girls mm-hmm. and like all kind of. But like, it was just shock rock, right? Basically, right? And, and 
But then I will in, in ICP's in ICP's defense, then I, I later heard I later heard a song, like a way later ICP song, which was like based on To Catch a Predator. Right. And it was about catching child molesters and like killing them and stuff. So I was like, okay. So they they figured they, yeah. They, yeah, they they figured out that that kind of stuff is, like is bad. Uh shout out to the uh, ICP song that's not a violent rap song and it's just kind of a chill song about heaven. Yeah, I love that song. That that's uh, uh, the fi- the the last song on Great Malenko. Uh, but uh, that's such a good song. That song will make you think. I know. I, when you when you get to those pearly gates of heaven, and will there be a maid who will, when you cough, will come and dust your balls off? Pro- I mean, will you will you live in that giant mansion? I love Where- that we. Ended up on ICP in the <laughs> Super Drag episode. Will, will someone hand you a blunt like a tree trunk? And then you try to hit it, but you can't even fuck with it? <laughs> uh, but yeah, okay, right. It's been a good podcast. <laughs> if Super Drag's out there listening to this, sorry that we, by the end of the podcast, we're talking yeah, about we're, ICP. Yeah, we're in the band punchline, and we're, we're, big, we're big fans. Yeah, we are big fans. I hope that nothing we said. I like to think that, like, Honestly, everybody we do an episode about, I like to think that like, oh, they'll probably listen to it because it's it's about them. Like right. if someone did a podcast about Punchline, like I would listen to it. Right. Like so um you know, that that uh I like to I, I'm kinda dreading like Tom Cochran hearing me drag him so much because <laughs> he seems like a really good dude. Right. But super drag, if you're listening, big fan. Big fan. I think Steve might be a bigger fan than me because he goes a little deeper into the catalog. But I am the one who brought feeling like I do to the table. Right. And definitely um, top five favorite songs of the last decade. I would say. Oh, nice. I love that That's song. Nice. And we think you're a one hit thunder. That's right. And we we as guys that like your band, we would love to have one hit. So right. I'm glad you embraced that one hit because you really should. And anybody who has one hit should not bitch about having one hit because there are people that have been playing music for a very long time that would love one hit. Right. <laughs> I would. I, I. I don't know. Like at this point, I, it would. It would be kind of a bummer to only have. You know, like, a no a no hit blunder. <laughs> yeah. <I don't, laughs> yeah. Hey. Yeah. yeah. This has been One Hit Thunder. One Hit Thunder is produced by Matt Kelly as part of the Geekscape Network and hosted by Chris Rafalius of the band Punchline, Pack, and Another Cheetah. You can hear the Punchline song Ghosty off their third album, Just Say Yes, playing underneath me. Punchline will be playing Anti-Fest on March 28th in Pittsburgh, featuring bands Annie Flag, Suicide Machines, and tons of other great bands. So visit their website, punchlion.com, for tickets, as well as news, merch, and other upcoming shows. Let us know your thoughts on the show by emailing us at onehitthunderpodcast at gmail.com and visiting all of our social media, which is found in the show notes. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to us on your favorite podcasting app, and we'll be back next week with another episode of One Hit Thunder. You won't forget those pictures, even if you burn the hard copy. listening to the Geekscape Network. The number you have reached is 100.7 WMMS. It wasn't just a radio station, it was a lifestyle. Cleveland is, is a rock and roll city for sure. I feel like the shot was... Yeah! Down! The Wrath of the Buzzer. WMMS. Cleveland. The rise and fall of one of the most iconic radio stations in America. Profiles, The Wrath of the Buzzard, P-R-O-H Files. Subscribe now wherever you get podcasts. Hey there, I am Johnny Christ from Avenged Sevenfold, and I've got a podcast called Drinks with Johnny you're going to want to check out. I sit down with a bunch of different people from all different walks of life, from professional wrestlers to actors, comedians, fighters, musicians, 
everything in between. I'm just looking to make some friends and have a good time doing it. So if that sounds like something you're into, go check out Drinks With Johnny, streaming everywhere now.